Welcome to Digital Therapeutics Edition of Digital Health Today, and I'm your host, Eugene Borohovich. In the previous episode, I spoke with Clara Campos, managing partner and co-founder at Asabis Partners. Asabis is a venture fund based in Barcelona, Spain, investing in healthcare and life sciences innovation. Today, I speak with Dominic Berzewada, CEO and co-founder of Perfood. Perfood, in their own words, is working on a pipeline of prescription digital therapeutics powered by personalized nutrition. But before we dive in, Dominic reached out over LinkedIn just a few months ago for a completely different reason. I still love having my serendipity calls with entrepreneurs, and I'm glad I took this one. I learned a lot from Dominic on our first call and quickly made a decision to feature a German DTX startup on this season and bring back a discussion on DIGA as part of this episode. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dominic. Dominic, welcome to the DTX podcast. For all the listeners that we have, would love to get to know you, who you are, a little bit of your background, and please don't forget, we always want one small interesting fact from our guests here. Hey Eugene, thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. I'm Dominic. I'm CEO and founder of Perfood. We founded the company together with three medical doctors around five years ago. And, you know, medical doctors, they can do anything, right? At least in Germany, we are saying <laughs> they can do anything. One of them was my cousin, but they don't want to do anything, at least not everything. And so after some time, they figured that out. They asked me whether I just want to join the company and take care of the business stuff. And that's the background I have in business startups, finance. And an interesting fact about myself, people can't see me right now, but you can. I'm eating around 500 grams of chocolate per week and I eat it at night and I don't have any problems neither with my weight nor with my teeth. And I've been doing this since I'm 15 years old. Wow. Well, I'm sure we can get some science from and collect that science from crowdsource it from others why that's happening or not. Good, interesting fact. That's the first one around food on this podcast. Let's keep going. And speaking of food, what was actually the prompt or instigation to start Perfood? The name itself, I can kind of assume why, but please tell us a little bit more on Perfood, the inspiration for it and the naming. Yeah, thank you, Eugene. So Perfood means for one personalized food and then also per as from Latin through food. And we are developing digital therapeutics and prevention products that all have in common that we apply personalized low glycemic diet as an active ingredient. So we are achieving the effectiveness of our products through dietary adjustments. And the reason we did that is there was some research coming out around five years ago that my co-founders read and they realized you have a variety of applications for low glycemic diet. Many inflammatory diseases are related to it, obviously diabetes, cancer, even migraines, which is our lead indications, but then also in a consumer weight management and prevention setting. So we have a lot of business model and technology options, and that's what we really loved about it. Tell us a little bit more about fundraising efforts. I've lived in Germany for four years. When I was moving away prior to the pandemic, the digital health scene has been thriving. But the conservatism of investors is still there and it has been there. So I'm curious, you mentioned five-year-old company. How has been your fundraising efforts and the journey through that process being a German company? So the fundraising environment, as of today, it's still difficult, but it's improving a lot. So what you used to see is life science VCs. And they were like, no molecule, no patent, no money. And then in Germany, we have consumer tech and SaaS VCs, and they were too regulated, too medical. We don't get it, no money. And that changes now because relative to biotech, I think digital therapeutics have a clear advantage because the development costs are much lower. They are much closer to commercialization, specifically under the new German DIGA law. And you have less clinical risk because even if you mess up a clinical trial, you can ask yourself, why did we screw it up? How can we improve the product? So overall, I think in a funding environment that we are seeing now, markets are cramped. Digital therapeutics are actually relative to other options that have received a lot of funding in the past, a very good options. Then again, on the consumer SaaS side, when you are in German reimbursement, 
you are not linked to consumer buying behavior or corporates purchasing and investment decisions. And that gives you rather predictable income streams. Most DIGA manufacturers would now say, ah, well, but it's still, you know, there's much homework to do, which is true. But uh, relative to consumer and thus options, I think DTX in a reimbursement setting make perfect sense as an investment right now. So it's getting better and we are seeing that. You're definitely not your typical grandma's or grandpa's DTX. And as you described earlier around per food, you're going through or with food as an intervention, but obviously a software driven intervention is a key component of an actual DTX. And I also know you're leveraging CGMs as part of that solution experience. Would love to kind of learn what is an end user, customer, patient, what does that experience look like? Yeah, sure. So what we do is we give people a continuous glucose monitor. These products have originally been developed for patients with diabetes, but they make sense for many other indications. And people then track their diet. They also track medication, activity, sleep, symptoms. And then we calculate which foods keep blood glucose levels stable and which gives them severe glycemic spikes. And the essence of the product is that you only have to leave out those foods that cause these glycemic spikes. So it's a very short list for most patients and they have to avoid these foods, which makes it much easier to adhere from an engagement perspective. It's always difficult to get people to do something, to tell them move more, stress less. But if you tell them what to specifically avoid, it makes it super easy. And that's what we are trying to achieve. And then we go ahead and build content around the disease itself, educate patients on the disease. So for our lead indication migraines, we have a headache diary. We also show them how to drink more water, how to stress less. So there are a lot of elements that you would find in many digital therapeutics, but built around that specific active ingredient of personalized low glycemic diet. You mentioned your first indication, which is interesting, right? Because to your point earlier, when you think about a CGM, it's about metabolic and diabetes. And how did you guys actually choose to focus on migraine as your go-to-market initial indication, which is what I believe you got through the DIGA, which we'll talk more around that. But from a business perspective and go-to-market perspective, how did you choose migraine? From a business perspective, we analyzed what our capabilities are. And back then, when we started developing our migraine product, we were just eight people in the company. And we always wanted to do type 2 diabetes because that's the DNA of my co-founders. They are diabetologists, immunologists, but it's obviously a much more difficult target group since diabetes does not hurt. Also, patients are oftentimes less tech savvy. And in migraine patients, you have super engaged patients in their 20s, 30s, 40s. The alternative therapy is at least for prophylactics. So in migraines, there are acute therapies with pain reliefs and tryptans, but also prophylactic therapies. And the first line in Germany is a beta blocker. And for a 20 year old woman, having to take a beta blocker for perhaps 10, 20, 30 years afterwards is super tough. Most people can't handle the side effects. So migraines made perfect sense for us. And the scientific concept is pretty clear. So what happens is our brain mainly works on carbohydrates. It cannot store energy itself and it has to rely on a steady flow of energy. And if there is a derailed blood glucose metabolism, our brain responds to it essentially with a fight or flight reaction, which then in some people triggers a migraine attack. So modern drugs try to address this energy supply in our brain by stabilizing it, um, by inhibiting certain hormones and the neurotransmitters. And we're essentially doing the same such as these drugs do, but by applying technology and personalized nutrition. We call that a drug equivalent mode of action. And for us, it's great because it's incredibly popular among patients. And we saw that in the very beginning in clinical trial recruitment. And we see it also now today in the DIGA prescriptions. Speaking of DIGA, that was a perfect landing for me here. 
In season one, we had Christian Dierks, who kind of co-wrote the law, and still early on, we now have a couple of dozen companies on there. It's always a challenging process. So we'd love to hear for the entrepreneurs, and by the way, the ones that are in Germany and tackling and deciding, but there's also lots coming into Germany. I think Indiga is kind of the way to enter Europe in general through Germany. Can you tell us the journey, kind of the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, and some of the processes around it? And then a subset to that is you just alluded to uh, clinical trial and recruitment. So what is the evidence and the level of evidence that's required in Indiga? So walk us through it, please. Yeah, it's a great episode that you had in season one. I listened to it and I can recommend it to anyone. So what the German government did a couple of years ago is that they wanted to give a structured path into reimbursement for digital therapeutics. Now, Germany is a centralized healthcare system. That means you have two layers. You have the risk perspective, which is regulated with the European medical device regulation. So you can call that the equivalent of the FDA clearance, if you will. But then also you have the reimbursement clearance, and that is done centrally in Germany. And so what the German government realized is that many people would benefit from structured lifestyle interventions. I mean, the biggest causes of healthcare problems nowadays are related to lifestyle associated diseases, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and so forth. But we were lacking structured programs that got reimbursed and would give the entire society access. So they created that DIGA law, which means Digitale Gesundheitsanwendung, or digital health application, but also digital therapeutics, if you will. And they first started by giving it a structured path to get approval. They also put it with a German authority called BFARM, so the German Institute for Drugs and Medical Devices, which you can consider to be the FDA equivalent, and just really set up that new process. And then you have certain criteria that you would need to fulfill. First of all, as Germans, we are supposed to love data protection, and we really do. So you have to fulfill a bunch of data protection requirements, then linked to that also data security and also interoperability. So you're forced to make all the data in the product interoperable, and then you need to provide evidence. And for evidence, they decided to create two different layers. For one, you have the chance to get reimbursement approval based on your RCT data. So just a randomized clinical trial that you would also do for a drug. But if you don't have that, then you can file for preliminary approval as a DIGA. And you get access usually for around 12 months. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's a good ballpark. And you can do that with pilot data if that pilot data makes it plausible that you will be able to achieve your primary endpoints in a confirmatory RCT. And this is where our migraine product is currently at. Now, the German Federal Institute of Drugs and Medical Devices is built up of very good, well-trained scientists that have been educated to avoid risk in drugs. It originates from the Contagan scandal in the 1960s. That's where the German pharma and medical law was created with the ambition never again. And so even on that pilot data, they are super strict. And if the data is not good enough, they will send you back to conduct another pilot study. And so in our case, it took us actually four attempts to get there. And we have conducted four pilot studies one really rudimentary, basic proof of concept study, and then three studies that have all been published. The latest two have been published in the summer in Nutrients. One was published in February this year in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. And now with these solid evidence to make it plausible that we can achieve the primary endpoint, we received that uh, preliminary approval. You said the good, the bad, and the ugly. To be frank, I think it's good that they have a solid level of evidence. And I think they are meeting a good balance of what works with the law and making sure that DIGA are trusted. Because after all, I mean, you could have the argument, yeah, we should just approve tons of them. 
And I think it would spoil the trust in society. So I actually like that they are a little bit more strict with the evidence. And even though it took us a long time to get there, I think it made the overall company stronger and more professional. And we learned a lot on that journey. First of all, appreciate for the listeners that did not listen to the full podcast in season one. I think this was a great, great lightning fast walk through Diga. So thank you for that and applying that to Perfood. And my only kind of comment and probably less of a question, but four tries, but it also sounds like they're very cooperative in that sense. They provide the feedback, what is required to go to the next step and iteratively for you guys as a company, as a young company to adjust. And again, it's not a blank, no, go away, never come back. It sounds like a great iterative cooperative process. Yeah, totally. You can have official meetings with them, like the Q submission meeting with the FDA, for instance. But with the DIGA team, you can just give them a call and usually they will give you some hints. And even in the process, you will receive feedback on everything that you're doing and they will really explain their decision. So yeah, it's definitely a great process and a great team over there. We're going to take a quick break and be right back with Dominic Bersavoda. CEO and co-founder of Perfwood. Especially as you're targeting migraine, and to your point, while diabetes is a silent disease for most, the migraine, you feel it. And there's probably some cash pay, and I know I've lived in Germany, you know, cash pay for anything, clinical, medical health is probably not a huge market generally across Europe generally. But your choice to go to DIGA, where we're hearing a few thousand prescriptions, a few hundred prescriptions, right? Again, I don't have the latest stats versus saying, well, this works. This uses a CGM. We have the science behind it. We have RCTs. Why go through the prescription route versus, hey, go and sell this as a service for a hundred bucks a month or whatever? I'm making up a number here. First of all, the German market for cash pay, it's much smaller than in the United States. And I think there are two reasons for it. First of all, we are used to having everything covered by our health insurance group. And then also we don't have any co-payments. So let's assume I was an American taking an app and being able to reduce my migraines with that, I would at least reduce my co-payments that I would spend on a monoclonal antibody drug. And the break even on a personal level would be achieved faster. And that I think might be one aspect to it. But then again, if you do anything in cash paid, you're targeting only a few people, those who can afford it. If you're in a reimbursement setting in Germany, virtually everyone has health insurance. So it's actually mandatory. And so you're targeting the entire market and there are around two and a half million migraine patients. Now, the initial investment, obviously, because you have to go through all the DIGA process, have to do your clinical trials, you have to fulfill all the data protection, data security requirements, makes it a little bit more arduous, a little bit more expensive, but it also makes the product better because you really make sure before you enter a clinical trial, whether you're happy with the product, you know, you're not just like ship. And so... I believe that in any case, if you have a product that is effective, then you should always target the reimbursement market. If it's a homeopathic product, at least over here, then it's for cash pay. Well, that sound means it's time for a question from my clinical and commercial partner on this podcast, Chandana Fitzgerald who is the Chief Medical Officer and General Manager of Health Excel, and as her friends call her, Dr. No Crack. Let's see what question Chandana has for our guest today. Hey, Dominic. So prescriber knowledge about your digital therapeutic is key, right? That's the only way they're going to prescribe it to their patients. So my question is, how are you approaching medical professionals? Thank you, Chandana, for the great question. You're totally right. And first of all, in DTX, in DIGA, you have two pathways. You can target patients directly and either they can get the prescription through a telemedicine process in Germany or you send them to the prescriber and you can actually use the patient to also educate the prescriber. And nowadays, prescribers in Germany become more and more open to that. The second part is that you have to educate prescribers directly And you just have to follow the traditional routes. I think the most important part is evidence. 
because that's the easiest part to convince people is with facts, even nowadays. And this is what we are doing. So we've published our data. We have done a health economic model that got published last week. We are publishing our RCT design and we are going to medical conferences and present our data. And I'm going to actually hop in here because, again, starting with migraine. So obviously, as you guys are picking up steam and as you alluded to the health economic data and going to the conferences, I guess your focus is on the conferences that surround things like migraine. And I honestly, I just learned, I didn't realize you could actually market to the direct to patients and consumers, almost alluding to it. So that's something, at least for me, I learned new today. Let's actually dive a little bit deeper. I mean, we talked about DIGA as a process and evidence generation. Can you talk a little bit about, because there's 20 plus, I believe, I haven't kept up, you know, shout out to Brian Dolan, who's also keeping track of it at Exits and Outcomes. But the pricing somewhat varies, but it's all sort of around. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you're 600 euros plus for the program. But how does that even work? Like, are you sitting at a negotiation table? Is the DIGA, is the government setting the price? Is there a formula? Demystify that for us, please. Yes, sure. So it resembles pretty much what we have in pricing process as in drugs. And what the German government did for drugs is they were allowing the pharmaceutical company to set their own target price. It's the APU, the target price of the manufacturer. And why are they doing that? Well, Germany is a reference market for many other countries and the German government is interested in bringing in the best newest drugs to start with. And by giving that incentive, they're able to do that, which is good because that's how our healthcare system maintains a great quality and is a first mover in many terms. And then after one year, the manufacturers go and negotiate with the lead associations of our statutory health insurance groups. Usually in drugs, private insurance groups tag along. They don't do that in DIGA yet. Hope that we are getting there. And so it's the same. In the first year, the DIGA manufacturer will set a price that is obviously at the upper bound where the manufacturer believes that's fair and reasonable. It can't be too high. Now, maybe listeners would ask, why don't you just ask for a billion per prescription? <laughs> <laughs> so the German system has a lot of checks and balances. And the prescriber in general is inclined to start with the most economic therapy to begin with. So if our therapy is the most economic one, we know that in theory, at least the prescriber should start with that one. So that gives you an incentive to be a little bit cheaper than the most expensive alternative, what you're priced to relative towards. And this is basically how you're doing it. And then after one year, you again, just as the pharmaceutical company, you sit together with the statutory health insurance groups and negotiate your price. And what you really have to make sure is that you craft a good value story. And that means what's the pricing of the alternative therapy? How are you justifying your savings? How are you proving it? How robust is your evidence to prove that? So in migraines, it's obviously reductions in other medications. It's reductions in sick days, which is a huge driver for the economics in migraines. And so then you just go ahead and dive deeper into it. And what you mentioned now is that many companies in Germany, they got repriced after their first year. And they're all circulating around 200 to 300 euros per quarter. Why is that the case? Well, many of them are psychotherapy DTX products. So they are being benchmarked relative to personal psychotherapy group therapy options and since they are benchmarked well rel all relative to that they are all obviously at the roughly similar pricing level so i see oftentimes specifically investors asking will all digas end up in this range probably not and it's just because the comparable therapy is not the same yeah, super interesting. And I think we'll probably dive deeper into the investor thesis on DIGA companies. I've actually heard that many are not betting on DIGA's big hyper growth for any of their portfolio companies. So curious what you're hearing there. 
Yeah, definitely. And so we are observing a couple of things now. There's actually what's what I found interesting lately at conferences. There are many private equities now looking at DIGA and considering whether they can do a roll up, a consolidation. And it's a little bit odd because when you don't have a DIGA yet, you're right at the seed stage. And at the siege angel pre-seed stage, it was easy for many to get funding. That wasn't a problem at all. And then something weird happens. Now, people get DIGA approval and they start raising a Series A. Think like, okay, great. Now we get traction, we have sales. And then the Series A investors are like, yeah, but you don't have your final evidence yet. So you might lose your DIGA approval. Yeah, that could happen, technically. Then also, yeah, you will probably be repriced, right? Yeah, we'll be repriced like a drug. I mean, it's happening. Yeah, so that's too risky for us. We don't do it. And so many of these DIGA manufacturers that got approval, they are now making between 5 and 10 million euros in annual revenue. They are sort of operating cash flow break even, and they haven't raised the Series A. And now they get their final approval. They're being repriced. And what happens? Well, they're still growing and still are making money with it. And then they approach the Series A investors again, and they're like, yeah, but now you guys making too much revenue and you are too expensive for us, so we can't invest anymore. <laughs> So it goes. Interesting. And probably a much deeper discussion over a beer somewhere in Germany another time. Yeah. With a chocolate on the side. As we're nearing the end, I would love to ask you advice, not necessarily for me, but maybe for other entrepreneurs that are trying to take kind of the DIGA pathway or any other advice actually in the market. For entrepreneurs, I think you should always start with very solid evidence and make sure that you start developing with your clinical trial designs in mind. And that's not only for approval, but also for value. And make sure that you set up the company that you can get there. Because it might be unpredictable whether you're going to get DIGA approval immediately or not. It might take a couple of years longer, just as in our case, and we are not the only ones. So you need to be prepared for that. Well, we started with you in the beginning, and a super interesting fact. would love to end with you. And what makes you get up in the morning? I think in digital therapeutics, we are probably in one of the most privileged spots in business in the world right now. After all, 90% of healthcare costs are related to lifestyle associated diseases. And as a society, we need to solve that. Within the next 20 years, we need to solve anything related to metabolic health concern, to mental health concerns. And I think digital therapeutics are the best shot that we have. And for me, it's just fantastic because I'm getting so much access to great medical doctors. We are doing so much research. We're developing a colon cancer product together with the German Cancer Research Institute in Heidelberg and the University of Lübeck. So having that outlook that in 10 years, perhaps people will be able to survive and have a great life just because of technology and personalized nutrition. It's an incredible perspective and I love working on that. Well, that's an amazing cause. So thank you for spending the time and thank you for educating our listeners. Thank you very much, Eugene. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning into the Digital Therapeutics Edition of Digital Health Today, a production of mission-based media. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast player so you're automatically notified each time I speak with one of these amazing leaders and trailblazers who are forging the path for digital therapeutics. If you'd like to learn more about Your Coach Health or Health Excel, you can find the links to this and more in the show notes for this episode. I'm Eugene Borohovich, and catch you next time.